Nogi World Championships went down over the weekend in Dallas, Texas. We were there to bring you the action live, and man, we saw an entirely new wave of champions coming through the ranks to claim their first World Championship gold medals. But that's not the biggest story. That's not the biggest story of the weekend. The biggest story of the weekend is that we almost died last night <laughs> driving home in a tornado. That's the kind of commitment that the Flow Grappling team has because we leave Dallas, Texas to take the three hour car ride back home to Austin. And what do we do? We power through an actual tornado to get here to bring you the Grappling Bulletin podcast. My name's Hal Teague, this is Chase Smith, and in the back is Corey Stockton, who was in the car with me last night and can attest that it got freaking sketchy out there, right, Corey? I spent about five minutes in the passenger seat typing out my uh, <laughs> my la my final words. So yeah, it was a uh, it was a little crazy. That is actually the first time that I've ever been in an active tornado situation, and I was driving the car. It was uh, it was pretty windy outside. How how pretty <laughs> freaking windy? No, no. So we're like we're driving along. It was and blustery. We got. <laughs> Well, number one, we're at the Nogi Worlds, and everybody who's like flown in from California and New York and stuff, they get a notification saying that their flight's been canceled due to severe weather warnings. And we're like, oh yeah, there's like storms and stuff coming, no big deal, don't worry about it. As we're driving south from Dallas, we're passing good old, good old Waxahaki, right? Which is like, you know, about 25 minutes south of Dallas, and we're kind of driving down. And everybody's phones in the car, simultaneously, we get a bang, that amber alert on our phones, right? And it says, tornado warning, take shelter, right? So we're like, well, what do we do? Do we, do we stop underneath a bridge somewhere? Or do we just power on? Like, what's the move here? Well, you know, mama didn't raise no bitch, right? So we're like, we can beat this, right? It's just gonna charge on ahead. This is why I don't travel with Hal. I, <laughs> I drove by myself home and uh, I left about 30 minutes earlier and avoided all start. of this. It was fine, so. To be honest, you know what the problem was? The problem was that we stopped at in and out <laughs> We were hungry <laughs> after the show. So after the finals, after the black belt finals ended, Chase, uh, excuse me, uh, Corey, Trey, Connor, and myself, you know, we decided to stop there at in and out which was full of Brazilians, by the way. It was all the guys from Nogi World. So there were Andre Porfirio, Max Jimenez, a bunch of other high-level black, Gabriel Souza, Diego Romalho, Estevan Martinez, a giant slayer, a uh, bunch of big names. They're all there to get their celebratory post-Worlds cheeseburgers. Delicious cheeseburgers. <laughs> if we'd skipped it and we'd gone for the healthy route, we probably wouldn't have been hit with a tornado. The podcast is going the rails quick, but I got to say, I had a great time at Nogi World, and we saw so many things. It was fantastic. It was a great event. It was really interesting to see. Uh, we're going to kind of cover a little bit of everything because, of course, you know, there was so many stories. Four-day tournament. There's so much to look at. Everything from, you know, the black belt absolute gold medalists to the, the new wave of, uh, of champions to the techniques that we saw, in, uh, you know, uh, on the mats as well because, of course, we talked a lot about the developing, uh, the changing face of nogi grappling in general in the IBJJF realm. Well, we can kind of dissect all of that. But I think the best thing to do is to start off talking about the two champions who took double gold at the Nogi World Championships. And that is number one, Pedro Mourinho, and number two, Rafael Aguedes. Pedro Mourinho taking gold in the heavyweight and the absolute division, and Rafael Aguedes taking the same heavyweight and absolute division, double gold. So uh, let's jump in and talk about Pedro. Chase, Pedro Mourinho, man. First year black belt. Can you believe it? Yeah, incredible stuff there from Pedro Mourinho all weekend long. Really, really aggressive uh, athlete. We were so sad when he had to pull out the WNO Championships because we knew how good he was and how his potential he has. Uh, that Gi team was just on display all weekend, oh, yeah. right? People, Sharp as ever. He presents the worst dilemma uh, an athlete could have. Either you try and stand up wrestle with him and really get nowhere. He'll or, throw you to the mat. Exactly. Yep. Or you shoot for the legs and he'll rip your head off. Yeah. There's really two options. So he, His guillotine is literally, man, it's the kind of choke that will decapitate you. It, like, you have to have a big, strong neck to withstand that. And here is a, a clip of the final moments of the absolute final where you can see that Pedro Mourinho, he got the win via decision and was just elated with the fact, you know, this is a, a huge deal for a man who, he was only promoted to black belt at the, you know, the early stage of 2021. And he went out and took out the veteran cyborg to win the gold medal, uh, having earlier uh, won the heavyweight gold. And uh, I mean, here's some clips of that, that wrestling exchanges, which was, 
kind of the theme of the match, right, Corey? Yeah, and it wasn't just the theme of the match. It was the theme of really his entire his entire weekend. He showed us a lot of his wrestling, wrestling even against guys like Victor Hugo um, and, and doing well there, but it paid off in, uh, in the match against Cyborg here, uh, in the match against Wagner Rocha earlier in the heavyweight final. His wrestling, his guillotines, he, he really has just the, the style to beat these guys, and it showed. So Pedro... He's a uh, Gracie Baja black belt training with Ulpiano Malakias there in Gracie Baja West Chase. Uh, by far the uh, the most successful uh, competitor from the, the team to uh, be in action at the Nogi Worlds. There were a couple of others uh, uh, who made it through into the um, into the championship rounds. Uh, thinking about Lucas De Silva who took silver in the lightweights and uh, Bruno Machias as well. He was kind of competing in the heavyweight division too. But uh, man... Pedro Mourinho just on another level and, and definitely one of those faces that I think people will have to respect going forward, right? That, that He's not just any black belt. He's not one of those black belts who's come in and he's just going to make up the numbers. This guy is immediately world class. Absolutely. You know, and I, I think the wins over Victor Hugo and Cyborg and Wagner and, and the other final uh, show that. But it's not exactly news. I feel like he's he's been winning... For, uh, everything for quite a long time. We have big wins over Roberto Jimenez as well, uh, showing off his heel looks in that case. But it was kind of his coming out party saying, like, I'm here to stay. I am right. no longer a surging prospect. I am the elite, and I'm going to rule this division. So, to be fair, he's been surging since he was a purple belt, right? So, I mean, he's just been accelerating constantly for three years. But yeah. now so it's, no surprise it's a crowning he arrived, achievement. Yeah. yeah, it's no surprise that he arrived in the black belt ranks mm -hmm. fully formed because he definitely has... Uh, been on the cusp, but, but I think this is a, a, a breakout moment for this young man, and uh, it's uh, it's very exciting to see. He's a, he's a powerful grappler. He's got a great, you know, really dangerous style of grappling. Great wrestling, as you mentioned. You know, the ability to take somebody's head off with a guillotine choke. And um, if this is uh, any uh, hint of what's to come, then the future is bright for this young man. But let's also talk about. Oh, also wait. Actually, we have an interview clip, I believe, with uh, with Pedro. Let's hear from Pedro before we uh, before we move on and just get some words from this uh, this young champion moments after he uh, collected his gold medals. At this time, Pedro Mourinho, the double gold at Nogi World, just seven months in the black belt. Uh, Tell me how you feel. Man, it's a dream come true, you know, like, I remember all that I passed come from Brazil, you know, to United States, be a, uh, look for a dream, you know, and now achieve this like a life goal, you know, and it's just the beginning, you know, like, I have much more to accomplish in this sport, and man, I'm so happy, thank God, man. <laughs> You, uh, you, you, of course, took out Cyborg in the final. Cyborg, uh, multiple, multiple time Nogi World Champion. How did how did that match strike you? Like, going into that match, knowing you had Cyborg coming up, and then, like, beating Cyborg. Yeah. How does that feel, you know? <laughs> Man, uh, I knew, like, as I was with Wagner, you know, Cyborg stuff, the, 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 the style is, is different, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it was a challenge, you know? I say, like, I, I, I need mixed strategy, you know? I cannot go head to head, I'm so light. I'm like a weighty 193, 194, you know, to, to fight open class in my division heavyweight. And I was, I, I had to, to be smart, you know. And I play smart, play, play well, and I knew that I could be, you know, could, I, could I become a champ. You were working that, that famous guillotine oh, yeah. in, in both Changed my life. In both finals, right? Oh, in, yeah. the, in the absolute final and in the, the heavyweight final. Um, were you surprised they were, they were shooting on you like that and kind of feeding you that guillotine? Man, like, like I say, the, uh, or whatever, like if you pull guard, I can apply for on top. Wow. If we, I'm on board, I can apply, you know. And if you shoot on me, we're gonna be dead at your chin, you know. It's not nice. <laughs> Okay, that's kind of interesting that he mentioned that he came in at like 193, 194. So he was only like four or five pounds uh, over the medium heavyweight limit. Mm, he could have quite mm. easily dropped to medium heavy. But he, so he, he was actually one of the lightest competitors in the heavyweight division, which the, the, the limit for that is 202. And yes, you know, was probably had a solid 40 to 45 pound dis uh, weight disadvantage in that absolute final as well. So that's kind of impressive. Uh, yeah, and I mean, we knew he was feeling good about himself when he doubled like Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo is a mammoth, a giant man. And uh, when they stand next to each other, the difference is, is extreme, <laughs> yes. basically. And so when he charged ahead and actually elevated, got some hang time of Victor in the air off a double leg, I'm like, okay, Pedro definitely has the power necessary to, to do whatever he wants in no the doubt. absolute. So. Very cool. Well, uh, that's... Uh, 
That's a, a tremendous performance for the young man from Gracie Baja this weekend. And uh, well, like we said, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on him from here on out. But uh, let's talk about the uh, the female double gold champion, Rafael Legedis, shall we? So uh, Rafael Legedis, man, she has just had the most incredible year. And let's just uh, rewind a little bit because it was in September of 2020 that she received her black belt at the hands of uh, Andre and Angelica Galvao, the you know, two of the, 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 the head coaches there at the Atos HQ in San Diego. And since then, Rafael Geddes has just just had an amazing, she's just been a bulldozing through every division that she's entered, every tournament that she's entered, she's taken gold medals, and the success continues to roll in as she collects her first world championship gold medal at the Nogi Worlds, and she took double gold, winning the heavyweight division, and the uh, the absolute gold. Is there anything stopping this young woman from Atos? I mean, it's tough to guess what that might be, uh, but she is really really just honing her skills over the course of this year uh we're seeing new things too it's not like she's winning the same way every time we saw for example in her final of Liz clay uh some really dynamic passing from Ooh, her we got a great clip of this let's continue chase but let's play it because you can you can see it in action as you're describing it right so liz clay of course has a very formidable guard no one really has that much success passing her especially from at range liz clay can usually windshield wipe her and create a frame with her as she tries there because she's so flexible she's very flexible but rafael gettys is able to cut through that more than once in this final and uh, and this rivalry that two, these two athletes have, she's now kind of running away away with it a little bit. At the black belt ranks, right, Corey? Because I think when they were still uh, a little while ago, I want to say up until the end of 2020, I think Liz Clay, she uh, she had uh, some significant wins over Rafaela. But since then, since the black belt, Rafaela's just, uh, she's, she's just accelerated ahead, right? Yeah, and as a matter of fact, the last time that Rafaela and Liz Clay were at Nogi Worlds was in 2019 when they were brown belts, and Liz Clay beat Rafaela twice in the same day. Um, and, and since then, Rafaela seems to have adapted something in her game and it is really, as Chase said, running away with this rivalry a little bit and getting better and better every time they meet. It's very rare to see Elizabeth Clay's guard get past. It's, uh, it was really impressive to see Rafaela Geddes basically use the same guard pass twice in the match. This baseball back grip of the ankle and then a, uh, a simple throw by. This was the second uh, attempt that nearly got her into side control. But uh, yeah, such a such a well timed execution. The way that she was diving into that top position, really, really powerful performance to take the double gold. My um, Hefei is a force, an absolute force. And of course, you know, I I think that this. I mean, we we need to update the rankings after this weekend. We literally just got back to Austin late last night after midnight, and we're straight back here in the office on Monday morning to uh, kind of digest and, and to gather everything together to be able to discuss it on the show today. So we haven't had a chance to update the rankings yet. But I'm feeling that this. What do you think, Corey? This could potentially elevate Hafaela to the number one pound for pound spot. No, I, I think she she definitely deserves to be up to be up there. She's not only a, a now two time IBJJ world champion in her first go, but also let's not forget who's number one champion, right? And she's she's been looking absolutely unstoppable this year. She she to me is the pound for pound best. That would be uh, removing or bumping down my Sebastos a spot, let's say. Only can really move down just one, right. considering that she also took gold over the weekend here. At Nogi Worlds, but Hafel took double gold, and that definitely stands for something. Ah, I think so. I think that's very fair, yeah. But, uh, man, Misa also so good, and we'll talk about her in just a minute because uh, very impressive series of champion performances at the Nogi Worlds. Let's move on, shall we? Let's uh, move on to the next I think topic. we have a clip from Rafaela oh, here we do? if you want to. Uh, oh, we have an interview with Rafaela. We oh, do. I'm sorry. Yes. Let's not cut short that. Let's hear from Rafaela because I believe she had something interesting to say, actually, in her interview. Let's play the clip. First world championship as a black belt, double gold. <laughs> Tell me about it. Uh, I feel... Uh, Amazing, great. So, it's a lot of work to describe, you know. But happy. Yeah. Uh, it's done, you know. Feels uh, like the the last time uh, you were at a World Championships, you lost to Liz Clay in the final. Since then, you're twice on the same day. Right. Since then, you're not four and zero against her. Uh huh. Is there something you're doing differently, or do you feel like you've figured out the way to the way to play against her? What is uh, it? I just fix something in my mind, you know, everything is right here, <laughs> so uh, after every tournament, I just adjust something in my mind and keep working hard, you know, mm -hmm. so that's it. 
So uh, interesting to, uh, to, to hear that it's not technical, it's not physical, mm. it's mental. Yeah, and uh, you know, stringing together a couple of wins against the same athlete definitely will have a uh, astonishing effect on one's confidence, right? And conversely, losing more than once in a row is definitely frustrating. I can speak more to that than <laughs> I can beating the same person over and over again. But uh, I mean, Rafael I Gettys is clearly at the top of her game. Yeah, and entering now. ADCC season now mm. she will have to go through trials unless there is uh, the chance of an invite you never know I'm not the guy who controls that well but. no uh, I, I saw on Instagram that Andre Galvao I saw him yeah. campaigning he was campaigning, campaigning. I can't blame him putting the feelers out there he's kind of saying listen she's who's number one champion she's world double gold champion she's won the Pandoki you know does she really need to go and do trials? She's pretty much won everything of significance here in the United States. I I think there's a strong case, but as you said, not our decision to make. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I can see I would the love case. to see her though, and uh, hopefully, whatever road she has to take works out. So yeah, I can see the case. I can see the case. Yes. So let's discuss the best champion performances from the Nogi Worlds. Um, there are some. There are a lot of champions. Obviously, there's like so 18 weight divisions in total, including the absolute. So uh, we're going to just dial in on a couple. And uh, I think we'll start off by, by just uh, mentioning, actually, before we get into the actual uh, the names that we want to feature. But we should mention about the, the an interesting statistic, right, Corey? So there are a lot of returning champions from the Pan Nogi Championships that took place earlier this year, correct? Yeah, in, in fact, seven of them. Uh, seven champions won Nogi Pans earlier in May and then came back to, to double down on that uh, later on at, at Nogi Worlds yesterday. Uh, wow. From bottom to top, Esteban Martinez, uh, Diego Pato, um, Jefferson, Gra- Jefferson Gra- Guarezzi stands out. Uh, th- there are a ton, but Maisa Bastos, Devontae Elizabeth Johnson, Clay Elizabeth and, Clay, Gianni Grippo. Yep. Gianni Grippo. Let's talk about Gianni Grippo, the lightweight champion mm. Gianni Grippo. For me, showing a uh, not a new game as such, but a new approach to competition, right? A new ferocity, right? He's, ferocity. he's really mm. looking to to get the finish at all costs in his matches. And before... Play the clip, please, Tyler. Yeah, we have a, a phenomenal finish in his final, in fact, right here, where he puts the pressure on with this arm triangle from the half guard and has an incredible squeeze. And you'll see actually puts his opponent to sleep here, which, you know, when you think of Johnny Grippo from a couple of years ago, putting guys to sleep was not going to be on the menu. It was going to be maybe getting the back and, 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 you know, dominating in the points game, but the finishes were not always uh, there. Johnny, in fact, hit three submissions on his road to gold over the weekend. And I love it, you know, because Johnny is no longer a spring chicken. He may look like it, but he's been he's a black belt for... What almost a decade at this point? I mean, like yeah, seven, seven years, eight 20, years. Twenty eighteen, maybe I think. Uh, Twenty thirteen, he got his uh, he got his black belt. Yeah, so yeah. you know, that's like a seven, seven, eight years. Yeah, um, man, Johnny. You know, I think that he realized the stage in the career that he's at. That you know, he doesn't have anything to prove. Uh, he's been around. He's won so many tournaments now. There's, there's not much left for him to do. It's only the world championship at ADCC that is escaping. It's got to be right? about personal satisfaction. Right? Yeah, he's a world nogi champion now two times after winning uh, yesterday you know a pan nogi champion a pan champion uh he's done pretty much everything there is so i feel at this stage in his career it's uh it's not about creating legacy it's about reinforcing his status as one of the best black belts in the lightweight division and he did that with he made a statement here at the nogi worlds and and i feel that this possibly in response to some criticism of his style as well because gianni has um has he was one of the the, the the front runners, one of the one of those the vanguard of the Berenbolo generation, mm, right? He true. came along and he had that very technical leg fighting style that uh, that to be honest, it pissed off the old school. You know, they weren't fans. They w- they didn't really like that kind of style of jujitsu, and uh, they didn't like it because it was really effective and it kind of shook things up and you know uh, but it also led to some very boring matches too not just gianni Fair. but the whole the whole generation itself we saw the rise of 50 50 and in 
some of those middle to late days of the 50-50 era. Kind of rough, yeah. They, they were very good at doing at canceling each other out and making some tough matches to watch. We still see it, but less less so these days. I feel so. I feel so too. I feel so too. And, and Gianni was uh, was part of that generation and was um, you know unwittingly kind of like classified uh, by many in the jujitsu community as an exponent of that negative style of jujitsu. Well, of course, you know I, I think he wants to shake off any kind of uh, you know stain on his reputation. He wants to he wants to you know charge ahead and he wants to show that hey my jujitsu it was more about just leg fighting and he went out and he got sucked into some leg battles actually i thought it was interesting that opponents such as lucas de silver in the final and, and specifically thinking about deandre corbe in the quarterfinal as well that these guys were actively trying to go after gianni grippo's legs mm -hmm. and that's a bold move in my mind because gianni is one of the best leg fighters in the world and you want to you want to go play a game with him well he was able to shut those attacks down and he was able to turn them into deadly arm triangle uh, choke counters and he submitted DeAndre Corby with an arm triangle in the quarterfinal and then put Lucas De Silva to sleep in the final so that's kind of a that's the, the consequence of the leg fighting game is that you know you might think that the leg locks are a silver bullet but actually you're opening yourself up to counters it, it, Johnny uh, definitely makes that case but again you mentioned that that is his A game that that from 10 years ago is what he's been doing since the color bell is forcing right. the unfair 50-50 basically and then going into the pass and uh, now he's just getting a little more killer instinct yeah because I feel like in the past he would have been more satisfied to kind of like get the back sink the hooks in mm -hmm. win by win by a point uh, a, a lead or whatever but he I think he was ready to tap some people out this weekend and I he did that certainly did he certainly Loved did yeah yeah it's great stuff from Johnny Grippo but just one of our champs here that had right. uh, killer instincts on display. Uh, yeah, an athlete we were talking about through. quite a bit is the giant slayer Estevan Martinez. And I don't think we've been this high on an athlete in a long time. It just kind of came out of nowhere. We're like, who is this this phenomenal showman, right? I mean, yeah. he, just, he just wants to put on a, a theatrical performance and also wins by submission. <laughs> well, number one, his nickname is the Giant Slayer because Estevan, he's not a very tall individual. You know, he's a rooster weight. He competes in the lightest possible weight category there is in Jiu Jitsu. And yet, and yet, he will enter into the absolute division, no fear whatsoever. And quite often, right, Corey gets put up against some pretty big dudes yeah he seems to be a little bit unfortunate in that light he he gets paired up with the heavyweights the super heavyweights the ultra heavyweights but he he does well you know he he kind of lives in the scramble and and uh, for the first especially the first two three minutes of the match he will give these these bigger guys a, a challenge and we we see that too in, in the rooster weight matches where esteban puts himself at risk a lot because he he win he wins he lives in the scramble so we see him taking a lot of chances and always coming out on top and yeah. he, no better example than his performance here in Nogi Worlds. So play this clip and we can talk about the finals match here because uh, I think that the the Estevan he he fights with an intensity that you know has maybe been developed going up against bigger opponents and <laughs> that is a classic Estevan guard pass technique right there and he makes these techniques work so going up against bigger guys when he faces somebody of his own stature man he just pours on the pressure and he overwhelms them and i believe i want to correct me if i'm wrong three matches three submissions correct yeah wow that is a hell of a way to win the gold medal here first time winning the gold medal in a world championships as a black belt he did win the uh gold medal at the pandogi championships earlier this year but this is the first time that he took it at the world championships winning the gold medal at the nogi worlds and uh, I believe that his corner man had some interesting advice. Diego Romalio, the ZR team black belts, had some uh, some great coaching advice from the corners, right? He strictly demanded a good show. He says, give me a show. I don't care if you win. Just give me a show. And I think that's actually highly technical advice in the case of Esteban because when he starts turning it up, things go the right way for him. He right. really does force mistakes, force openings. You know, and uh, while I'm having a bit of fun maybe with the coaching, it, it does seem to work with him kind of in the same vein of the Rotolo Bros, who are right. trying to force openings and wear down their opponents, break them down, make them commit an error. And we see that uh, showing in, in Esteban's game as well. Yeah, we love it. And we're big fans of Esteban, Esteban Martinez here at Flow Grappling. And we're very excited to have him on our next Who's Number One on October 20th. He's going to be competing against Damian Anderson in a prelim match. That is just next week, by the way. Well, Are you ready for that? It's like 11. Yeah, it's nine days away. It's the a week Wednesday. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right around the corner. So we'll talk about Who's Number One a little later. <laughs> Let's uh, let's finish up with our uh, uh, well, sorry, not finish up. Let's let's move on and talk about our next champion performance. We wanted to highlight Elizabeth Clay.
Elizabeth Clay uh, faltered in the absolute final against Rafael Legueris. She uh, took silver in the absolute division, and yet, and yet she took gold, her first world championship gold medal, this Nogi World Championships. Her first, excuse me, her first gold medal at the World Championships Nogi as a black belt. So I believe she's won gold as a purple belt. She's won gold as a brown belt. And now she collects a gold medal in the black belt division with this very nice guillotine choke. Play this clip and we'll take a look. Going up against Bridget McLeese of Hendo Gracie. And she was cycling through the submission attacks. Yeah, we saw a lot of uh, different looks from Elizabeth Clay throughout this match and the weekend. Um, I just want to say, it, 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 this, even though it's technically Liz Clay's first season as a black belt mm. and earning this title is a big deal. It feels like a long time coming because she's been competing at the highest level of Nogi uh, for at least two or three years now, even qualifying for ADCC as long as four years ago, five years ago. So um, it's great to see Liz Clay reach the pinnacle, reach the top, and oh, look at that finish things here with this high elbow guillotine. Beautiful submission. And yeah, she's she is a monster. I feel, I feel like um, her rivalry with Rafaela ha has definitely shown some areas of her game that need to be adjusted slightly if she right. wants to take on this absolute... Uh, title and um, I think specifically we talked about it is is the wrestle ups where Liz yeah. Clay doesn't necessarily want to, to attack from top all that often she can do it we saw her actually in uh, the opening rounds have some really great passing using the guillotine to move on move uh, across into mount things like that but someone as skilled as Rafaela Liz Clay has to really be on top of her game Liz is hyper focused on playing from the guard uh, a lot of the time right she's got such a dangerous guard and, and such deadly submission attacks it's you know very few very few opponents can withstand that so of course you know Liz has, uh, has spent such a long time in, in in developing those areas and to be honest I, I was very impressed I will give some credit to uh, Bridget McLeese there in the final uh, she hung in and those leg lock exchanges quite nicely I mean she fought out of some very deep submission attempts you know um, uh, it was interesting to see that Elizabeth Clay had to attack with an arm bar she had to attack with leg locks and she ultimately was able to finish it by a choke that's how durable Bridget McLeese was so that shows that Elizabeth has a uh, a very varied submission game, right? She's able to attack limbs, whether lower body or upper body, and she's able to attack for chokes. But um, you mentioned about her top game. When she's on top, she's very strong. She's got great positional control. But we don't often see her uh, sweep or wrestle up from bottom. We often see her get to top position uh, via sort of fighting for submissions. And then when her opponents are defending, uh, she usually can, if, if she loses the submission, then she'll play from top. So um, if there is any criticism of her game, and you know, this is not a necessarily a criticism of her as an athlete, but an area of development, because everybody, obviously jujitsu is so, so huge, everybody has areas they need to work on. I think that a factor that could help her going, like you said, going up against somebody like Rafael Legedi's, maybe uh, work in that sort of um, the wrestling area and trying to fight from top position because so far Rafael has been doing a very good job of avoiding those those threats. Would you agree, Corey? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that um, Rafael has clearly exposed something in, in Liz Clay's game and then Liz Clay has been dominant playing her guard. Rafael just has figured out how to defeat uh, Liz's guard. So, yeah, we, we need to see something more. She reminded us, I, I think, especially in that final, that she does have a, a nasty guillotine. She actually won Nogi Worlds as a brown belt with that guillotine. I think she finished two of them. So, uh, nice to see that her game has kind of re-diversified. For a while, it was very leg lock oriented, but she was telling me afterwards that she's kind of gotten bored of playing the leg locks when, <laughs> when she doesn't have to, which, I mean, she, she finished uh, this should come as a surprise to nobody every match up until the absolute final via submission. Um, so, her, her game is there, but we want to see what she can do from the top because I imagine that might help get her through the, those couple of people that have seemed to seem to have found her number. And that's Phenomenal. a great point, actually, is that there's literally like two people on the planet right now that kind of have an answer for Liz Clay. So yeah, good point. her <laughs> game works against 99.9% .9 of people out there. It's just, you know, that she has a boogeyman right now in half Valley Gettys. Yeah, so. yeah, very fair, very fair. Well, uh, as you mentioned, Liz Clay finishing pretty much everybody that she faced at Nogi Worlds and uh, going home with the uh, medium heavyweight gold medal. That's, uh, that's a huge achievement. So, speaking of huge achievements, the Unity crew. Man, the Unity crew had such a great weekend at the uh, Nogi World Championships. And um, they sent an army, as they always do. Such a strong competition team there. And important to note that when we talk about Unity, we're also talking about... Um, 
kind of associated or not officially affiliated but associated athletes who don't necessarily represent unity in competition uh maybe are representing other teams but are very much part of that expanded family the good of the the sort of the extended family i should say uh that that make up part of the unity team i think that the name in itself unity mm. kind of like you know shows that they're very open to that so yeah well they're in new york right because unity is, is a really small association i think there's only two schools that i, I know of. there's actually three there's one in poland that i'm aware oh, of too yeah, there yeah, you so go. maybe yeah. there's a few more but relatively small and uh cicero costa and them have a strong bond and my sebastus i think represents gf team gf team and, yeah. and the only gf team member that really trains over there so right. when these athletes are coming to nogi worlds they're coming from more or less Merlo santana's room in new york right. city and he produced no less than four champs this weekend at Black Belt level. That's right. He was in the coach's chair more than anybody over the weekend, I feel. But uh, let's talk about those athletes. So Maisa Bastos taking her third Nogi World Championship gold medal. Diego Pato uh, taking his first World Nogi uh, gold medal after winning Pan Nogi earlier this year. Jefferson Guarezzi taking the medium heavyweight gold medal. Again, a returning Pan champion. And Devonte Johnson, super heavyweight champion again also taking gold at the pans earlier this year so all four of them took pan nogi gold medal and followed it up with a gold medal at the world nogi championships as well um let's talk about them a little first uh, before we hear from devonte johnson about the uh, about their runs my sebastos had a very tough match against uh i should say she had a, a dominant showing against the very tough mm -hmm. opponent in sofia amarante in the uh, light featherweight final and um, Misa, man, just looking technically solid as always, such a clinically efficient grappler. She is, you know, one of the very best pound for pound in the world. Um, but Sophia hung in there, huh? She did. She did a nice job. Uh, I mean, I mean, she was really hanging there at the end when Misa had that triangle where the, when time expired. But uh, Misa's passing was so good in this match, and I, I had dreams of that truck back take, you know, because <laughs> it was just so smooth and it. it is perfection right my sebastian is really technically one of the best to ever do it i think and uh yeah not not a surprise that she claims her third title and it's hard to see who, who might take her out at, at roost away at this point in time right really really strong stuff from Misa. yeah my, uh, but my reminded me uh, uh after after her uh her third gold uh, her third gold medal that she is currently undefeated in nogi competition as a black belt so there it's got to be something like 20 undefeated in nogi matches Wow, that is phenomenal. That is incredible. Uh, Diego Pato had a, uh, uh, a great match with Gabriel Souza in the final. Um, Gabriel Souza, almost impossible for him to have a bad match. You know, he's a, uh, he's a firecracker. And, um, and Diego Pato, I think it, he loves that, right? He's, uh, he's got a very, a very strategic style when necessary, but he can scrap. He can throw down, you know. And, and Gabriel Souza comes hard, and Diego Pato met that in the middle, and it was very... Very great, uh, really, really good run for Pato in general over the weekend. A solid series of, uh, of, of wins there. Jefferson Guarezzi actually took the gold medal in the medium heavyweight final via a technical penalty. Uh, his opponent, Pedro Hosha, was uh, penalized for a lack of combativeness. That's a theme that, unfortunately, we saw a little too much of over the weekend from various grapplers in both champions and non-champions alike. But lack of combativeness, lack of combativeness a.k.a and not engaging, a.k.a. stalling, mm. happened a lot, unfortunately, and something that we would like to see addressed uh, a little more assertively by the referees, by the officials. I have strong feelings on that matter. Chase was calling me out yesterday, thinking I was being a little bit too vocal in my opinions, but, man, I think somebody needs to call them out. Well, I mean, there's getting your message across, and then they're just being a dick. But um, <laughs> Call me a dick? I, I did not. I was saying generally speaking. But... <laughs> In any case, yeah, the stalling does happen, and to me, it, it's it's understandable. And this is why I relate. Where it's like if someone presents you a challenge that you don't like, you don't just want to wade into it. And if they have if, if it, there's no other way around, you yeah. have sort of a deadlock scenario, right? Yeah, fair. But I think that there was some uh, there was some horrible. Uh, strategies at play over the weekend and uh unfortunately pedro hocha had some great matches that he finished earlier in his campaign and uh you know i'm thinking about his brutal guillotine finishing you know in his quarterfinal and semi-final matches i want to say and yet in his final he was penalized for a um, I mean, you know lack of combativeness and let the gold medal slip through his fingers definitely dis so. disappointing given that his run he was yeah. so fired up right i saw him after he submitted mike perez right he says today's my day i'm in the groove i'm feeling it 
and then um, you know he just and Jefferson, you know, let, let's, let's just, I think Jefferson is probably you know happy that he took the gold medal and yet probably not satisfied that he was awarded it via a penalty against his opponent. He wants to win convincingly, I mean, right? It's so definitely not a highlight real finish, no, by any means. It's a um, shame. But anyway, it's moving the way on. it goes. Devontae Johnson, though, wow, he had a uh, he had a great run as well. Devontae Johnson had to take out the very tough. Joseph uh, Dirkhuizen in the uh, super heavyweight final. Dirkhuizen came from nowhere. You know, this guy is one of those um, one of those competitors who's a really tough black belt, but we hadn't really seen much of in the IBJJF uh, on the IGB, IBJJF scene up until this year when they you know they they changed the rules on the leg locks, which drew a lot of new blood. It drew a drew a lot of new blood into the into the ranks. Dirkhuizen took out Arnaldo Magdana with a rear naked choke. And then submitted ADCC silver medalist Vinicius Tractor with a calf crush, a calf Brutal. slicer. Brutal. Brutal calf with slicer. One second left on the clock. Yeah, 9 minutes 59 seconds into the 10 minute match. That was incredible. Down on points and just mm -hmm. went after it and, and submitted his, his opponent with one second left on the clock. So, Dirk Eisen was a very dangerous opponent. And Devonde Johnson uh, had to play a very smart game, but went after it went forward won convincingly uh get in the back in that match but i think probably for me his most impressive performance was choking out felipe andrew or nearly putting felipe andrew to sleep with an anaconda choke uh earlier in the day right Corey? yeah he uh he looked fired up in that match he reminded me that they've kind of had this back and forth rivalry for for years all the way back since blue or purple belt um but he he lashed onto that anaconda and and absolutely knew it was sunk in he started i think rolling through um it, it was absolutely a guaranteed victory the moment he locked it up yeah, it was really something special, and uh, Felipe Andrew is, himself is a very dangerous competitor. Mm -hmm. And Devonte Johnson had to take uh, you know him out, and uh, and then also followed it up with that win over Dirkhuizen in the in the final. Very very convincing performance. Let's hear from Devonte. He had some good words to say after this match. Big day for your Unity team as well. Jefferson won, Maisa yes. won. Uh, you you round that off with uh, with with your first place yourself. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about the work you guys are doing. Just like I said, you know, they're doing the same things, you know, powered by good people, you know, we're just killing each other every day, you know, and I remember like two weeks ago, I talked to Jefferson, I was like, bro, we're going to do this again, we're going to run Pan Ams again, because he and I both won Pan Ams too, and uh, we are our main training partners, you know what I mean, I don't really have many big guys to roll with, but, you know, Jefferson feels like a big guy, and uh, he's tenacious, and he pushes me every day, and I push him every day, and today we just wanted to get dirty and get what was ours, and I'm just happy that we both got that, you know. If I would have won, the win felt as good if he didn't win. You know, so I'm happy we both won. Isn't that great? Isn't that great that uh, as a team they went into this with a shared confidence that, mm. that saw all of them make it to the top of the podium? I gotta say, that's really cool to see. It really is a, uh, a theme there among the Unity crew. They're a very tight knit group, you know, as we mentioned. It's only basically you've got three gyms you've got Unity in Manhattan. Bones, aka Devonte, he's got his gym out in uh, I want to say it's uh, Patterson, uh, New Jersey, uh, and he's got his Unity crew there. A lot of big kids program, and then there's a Unity affiliated gym in Poland. So uh, not exactly a, a global I wanna network. Know, I want to know how that one popped up. That's like, a great question. What, what, they, what, what connection there was? It must be some you know old friend of Marillos or something from. Brazil, you'd have to think, but who knows, man? Like maybe some Polish guys have an email. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> but they, you know, they roll deep when they turn up, and it's a very, a very tight knit crew. They really support each other, and uh, amazing to see those guys put four, fa four finalists into the Nogi Worlds and take home four gold medals in the black belt divisions. Pretty impressive. Speaking of impressive, let's mm. talk about Checkmat. Man, Checkmat had such an amazing weekend uh, at the Nogi World Championships. Uh, they actually took the team trophy, both for the male and female wow. overall, That's which impressive. is huge. That's really, really impressive. But um, I think I, what I'd like to do is to focus on actually the um, the color belts because they uh, Checkmat actually put finalists into the brown belt absolute final and the purple belt absolute final they closed out the brown belt absolute final and uh, and then two athletes who don't train together uh, they actually fought in the final of the purple belt absolute let's start off talking about uh the the brown belts jansen gomez and el monstro aka elder cruz as he's better known and you can play this video as we're chatting tyler because this was man this was so cool to see the brown belts the they are the 
the the champions of tomorrow the black belts they're going to be the, they're going to be champions from years to come so seeing them do their thing in the uh, in the brown belt absolute uh, these were the semi-finals actually this is Jansen Gomez versus Felipe Costa and then you'll also see in a second El Monstro versus Jacob Couch man this was so entertaining right Corey yeah absolutely uh, J- uh, Jansen has just had this this incredible pace really all year and he's he's really uh, putting it on but Elder Cruz against uh, against Jacob Couch just took a, a real decisive lead in that in in that uh, kind of rivalry they're building. Um, Friendly and- rivalry, great sportsmanship between mm-hmm. the two, but yes, a definite uh, <laughs> healthy rivalry, right? Absolutely, yeah. They, they they like to beat on each other a little bit. Apparently, these guys almost fought in, in the absolute. <laughs> ah. I heard. I heard- I nah, mean, they closed down. Not it was all almost, good. It was all, it was all They were smiles. joking about yeah, it. Yeah, they were joking about yeah, it. They're okay. teammates. So, okay. uh, Jansen Gomez trains at the Checkmate HQ there in Signal Hill, and and uh, El Monstro trains with Lucas Leach out in La Habra. Uh, they do train together in the competition team training sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, they were kind of like a little like they after after they both won the semifinals, and you know the the final is the the moment where you decide you know you go on, you do the ceremonial hand raise, one or the other takes it, and they were kind of a moment. It was like so. Wait, are we? Are we are we closing out? Are we fighting? You're, and, you're giving me gold. Uh, no, uh, right? it wasn't. And nobody <laughs> nobody asked actually. But it more it was more a case of like, well, do you want to fight? And like, well, I don't want to, but I will. And, you know, it was that moment. So it was it was kind of funny, but uh, really cool to see the Checkmat team uh, doing so well because of course Jansen won his weight division and then Elder won his competing in the correct me if I'm wrong, Corey, the medium heavyweight and heavyweight is that correct? Correct. There you go. And then both making it through into the finals of the absolute storming, storming run from both athletes who are really just poised to take over. And Jansen followed that up because he took double gold at Pans as well, right? In the gi. Yeah, I believe uh, he took double gold and Elder took gold in the heavyweight in the gi as well. Wow, these guys are doing something special out there. Steamrolling. They really are. And then uh, Andrew Tackett, the, uh, the checkmate representative. Man, this is a phenomenal statistic. Nine matches from the weight division and the the absolute combined eight submissions. That's a lot of work. And I, you know what's crazy? I remember he Rolled put out an identical headline for Andrew. Uh, I think it might have been the Austin Open or something. But he had, let's say, eight matches, eight submissions. I mean, the kid just kills everyone. And it's if you make it to the belt, Andrew Tackett, you're something special as well. Yeah, and, and this was the, uh, his only opponent who did, I believe. No, oh, no, no, actually, sorry, excuse me. This is the absolute final that he also won by a submission. And uh, this was a, a fellow Checkmate representative, but one. Uh, the, Andrew, does, they don't train together. Um, so It know, was like, actually, uh, I think Lucas Leach was in the corner. I don't know if that's where the other athlete manages to train full-time or anything, but it was Lucas yeah, Leach versus this is, in the coach's corners. <laughs> yeah, Dory uh, Aoun in the in the Open Class final, and, uh, and Tackett was able to take that one but man Andrew Tackett just relentless and and just non-stop he literally he barely stays in a position long enough to score points he's just always moving and you can see it right there you know he just goes constantly on the attack and just hunts after the submission it's uh oh man, I wish I had a gas tank half as good <laughs> as Andrew Tackett right yeah yeah absolutely and he exemplifies something that we're going to get into uh in a little bit here about blending all of grappling's techniques uh, available in the encyclopedia. His great wrestling, uh, amazing top game, not afraid to dive on a leg if he can, and even knows the advanced illegal techniques as well. Uh, you know, as a purple belt, he can't use an IBJJF. Hey, he'll be a force at brown belt. Exactly, man. exactly. Imagine. Yeah. So um, it shows that the youth and the, the next generation of athletes have really uh, woven together an exciting tapestry, let's call it, of, of grappling techniques. Yeah, really nice moment there right at the end of that clip between Andrew Tackett and his coach, Rodrigo Brucutu, right here in Austin, Texas, at Brazilian mm-hmm. Fight Factory, the uh, the Checkmat team. And I thought it was really nice as well because uh, uh, Andrew's whole family were right there on the sidelines. His elder brother, William, his younger brother, Caleb, his mom, his dad, <laughs> everybody was there to support him through to that amazing performance. Uh, something special indeed. Go back and you can check out all of Andrew's matches on the archives and, and it's just, a show right mm. the real show <laughs> you're gonna get it yeah eight, eight submissions you can't go wrong with that <laughs> yeah check back doing something really special at the moment in developing the next wave of competitors both purple belts and brown belts looking very very strong indeed well um i think it's important because the future of nogi you know and we have this uh we've kind of we've been having this conversation over and over and it, it bears 
you know, sort of returning to because the future of Nogi is, is, is not certain, you know, it's very much in flux, it's very much in development, you know, we're always moving from one thing to the next, we're learning all along the way, this year particularly has been a year of great learning, you know, because the um, the Nogi game looks very different in 2021 to as it maybe has in recent years, at least in the IBJJF scenario, because Nogi revolution, in general, I would estimate, and give me your thoughts on this, Corey, but I would say that the Nogi game really changed around about 2015 would you agree yeah i think in the span between maybe 2015 and 2017 there was a, a more of a gradual change but yeah i think within that time it, it definitely there was some kind of event right where where jujitsu and and no jujitsu and nogi jujitsu kind of separated more significantly i think a big part of that was due to the uh the introduction of many more submission only events and i'm particularly thinking about uh the tail end of metamorris and also the introduction of eddie bravo invitational so you know metamorris had always featured gi and no gi it was submission only um and there were sort of a few athletes who kind of competed on that and and, and came through and specifically thinking of people like gary tonan of course and um then when eddie bravo invitational came along eddie bravo uh, excuse me eddie cummings and gary tonan they both had great success so in Gordon those tournaments well. and then followed by Gordon Ryan who would go on to become you know at that stage Gordon wasn't Gordon you know he was just Gordon you know and he wasn't the king yet right now he was just some loud purple belt that <laughs> you know and everyone despised him basically who is this kid who has has the gall to call me out you know what I mean I'm a black belt world champion this guy's some purple belt very much so so the, different times back then back then they were the uh, the original vanguard the original crew from the Danaher death squad and they definitely were right there in the vanguard the uh, the sort of the changing face of nogi grappling and since then that 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 development that growth has been considerable and uh it's certainly not over it's not done with the, the face of nogi grappling is is always developing and you know we've obviously contributed to that so you know who's number one we throughout 2020 and, and 2021 we've you know showcased submission only grappling and um this year the, the 2021 ibjgf introducing heel hooks was a game changer an absolute mm -hmm. game changer so you know the 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 current development and the current nogi game as it looks in 2021 is so different mm -hmm. to as it was just a couple of years ago would you agree Sure, and I think it speaks to, um, and we can, do you want to run the highlight? I sure. want to save it. Let's run this highlight we have here, too, of these heel hooks. But um, athletes are always going to look for exploits, right? People have really defined game plans and strategies that they can rely on to feel confident in, and maybe they ignore other parts of the game. Well, that was sort of what we were describing before. Heel, heel hooks became very popular in 2013 through 17, let's say, when that revolution took place. And we saw guys realize that, oh, People don't really know what they're doing down there with the, with the leg locks. We can really win quickly and effectively across many different organizations. So that took place over the last several years. Well, now we're seeing it introduced to uh, one of the biggest stages in jiu-jitsu in IBJJF. And people have, I think, rapidly caught on. Because as we mentioned, the the champions that we saw uh, this year at Nogi World and Nogi Pans are some of those familiar faces, right? They're, they're, they're pre-existing champions. Right. That they've done well before, but they're using these new techniques. And right. so as the as some of the more established athletes have, have uh, adopted the, the modern trends, we also see the next generation already working on it as we see some brown belts here. That's great insight, actually. So the the introduction of these uh, of the leg locks hasn't changed the status quo as much as you might think, but the Nogi game, the Nogi Jiu-Jitsu that we're actually looking at at these tournaments, the matches that we're watching, look very different to as they used to. And the one thing, wow, you almost never see the 50 50 guard anymore and when you do i mean <laughs> there's some risk involved i mean there's we saw uh diego romano really exploit that uh, to great effect yeah in his there was match. a little clip of that in the yeah. middle of that highlight it was a blink and you'll miss it moment because you know he he kind of he got caught in the 50 50 there um bruno matias from gracie baja actually drew diego romano into the 50 50 and diego was uh, was kind of hanging out there for a minute and the moment that the heel became available he ripped it on ripped it on it, it was nasty. a massive it was just a huge explosion into the leg because you know what that's what's going to happen you leave your legs hanging out people are going to take them home mm -hmm. and you know it's um definitely not a good place to be anymore so it's it's not it's not that the position is dead number one the position can actually be used to attack from 
It's yeah. much more exciting. Yeah. Much more exciting now, right? We're not seeing as much stalling out. Maybe, right, maybe the 50-50 is dead. Long live the 50-50. <laughs> because maybe, yeah, I like we're that. seeing the finishes now. So, What do you think, Corey? Yeah, it's it's absolutely not that it's dead. It's just it's dead as a safe haven, right? It's no longer a position you can go to and relax in. Um, and if you do, you better be prepared to get out safely. Um, as opposed to just opening it up and hoping that your your heels stay safe, but it's not just that um, that Nogi looks different in IBJJF now than previously because of the presence of heel hooks. I think that's a major factor, but I think a lot of it is that for for the last couple of years, Nogi Jiu Jitsu and uh, Nogi grappling and Jiu Jitsu have been two separate entities, right, and kind of diverging away from each other. And I think that's starting to pick up um, in in all spheres where it's not that the same techniques work the same in gi and no gi it's the the no gi techniques are making their way across the no gi competitors and starting to become more more present we see that in things like body lock passing like successful wrestling um it's really just the the no gi style uh, the the no gi zeitgeist is kind of taking over um in in all layers of, of competition yeah yeah great point great point indeed and the heel hooks is uh, it's, it's the easiest thing to point at, right? The leg locks, the leg lock revolution. Uh, nothing new for, for a lot of people who have been competing on the Saboni or ADCC scene for the last couple of years. Something new for the IBJJF uh, focused uh, competitors. But um, another big theme that we saw over the weekend as well, particularly in the color belt ranks, was the wrestling. So no gi grappling, of course, you know, you... Uh, Wrestling is such a big factor because not only in the takedown phase, but also wrestling up from sweeps. We've talked about the wrestle ups so often, you know, about how effective they are in Ogi grappling, how difficult it is to sweep somebody using the guard, and how much more effective it is to wrestle your opponent down. But uh, there, was, uh, there was something of an unexpected uh, occurrence over the, 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 the period of the Nogi world there, especially on day one and day two. In the brown belt, excuse me, in the blue belt ranks. We can go ahead and uh, run this highlight here, Tyler. Do it. On on day one of the uh, the blue belt divisions, there were a lot of very capable, very credentialed wrestlers competing, including Michael Pixley right there, uh, Division II uh, NCAA champion, NAIA uh, champion, uh, wrestled to a very high level. He took double gold, won the absolute, I believe, with all submissions, and um, there were, you know, both the men and the women's divisions, there were there was a tons of wrestling. The, remind me of the name of that wrestler right there, uh, the, the competitor, the Blue Belt Absolute Champion. Corey, Blue the, Belt Absolute Champion in the women's divisions. Um, Maybe you can look it up for me. Whether you call up young Jamie here. Yeah. <laughs> but in any case, what, what a, I think what we're trying to highlight here is that there is a... Eloisa, Eloisa Oliveira, there we go. Yeah, and she, this is interesting because she's a, um, she's not only was she a blue belt champion, but we, uh, we, we discovered that she, oh, she's come up through the ranks wrestling, in, 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 you know, scholastic wrestling as well. So, a, uh, you know, a, an aspiring martial artist, you know, a blue belt, a Gracie Baja organization, uh, family business, and is also, is also getting in the reps on the, the wrestling mats as well. That's a recurring theme, and, and we saw it in both the blue and the, the brown belt I mean, ranks on it. days one and day two. We see it everywhere, and we that do. last clip really highlights what I think we're, this conversation is going towards, is the refinement of this technique where it's not just okay we're gonna wrestle now then we hit the ground and we do jiu-jitsu no it, there is a a uh, collaboration or a merge of these t uh, these two different disciplines into what we would just call grappling or jiu-jitsu right where right. the takedown leads into a body lock and then that the, it's just an extension of one long sequence and uh, as Corey says maybe maybe no gi really is uh, completely Diversion. divergent now from gi jiu-jitsu and we have more and more gyms specializing in mostly no gi and as you, as more time is spent there yeah we do but it's not the, that big it's, it's not, not that big, big yet but we're moving that we direction. had this conversation last week the gi's not dead it's not i'm not saying it's, it's not dead. it's not changing that much i'm it's, not saying it's, it's, it's diverging stylistically mm. but i'm not convinced i'm not convinced that no gi jiu jitsu no gi jiu jitsu is separating from gi jiu jitsu because and this is why 
is because most of the people who win gold at the Nogi World Championships also win gold in the major gi tournaments. It is a bit of a paradox, I would say. Yes. It's not a paradox. It's quite obvious. They're just good at both. <laughs> you know, it is possible to be good at both. I like people, my version better. You, you, you people, keep yours. People think that you have to shed the gi to become great at no gi, and it definitely works for some people, but it is possible to do both. It's all jujitsu. I never said it was impossible. No, I know, but I'm just like the contradictory point of view. Well, the Nogi revolution is by no means over, but it is happening. And the best place to follow that along is here on Flow Grappling because we have so many great Nogi events to watch. So you can see that evolution in real time. Let's uh, talk a little bit about some of the upcoming events that we have on Flow Grappling because the next couple of months are extremely busy from here right through till the end of the year. We just have event after event after event major events all on the horizon very excited for so many of these let's start off talking a little about who's number one the return of gordon ryan this goes down on october 20th that is as you mentioned earlier chase a mere nine days away a wednesday debut a of a wednesday. weeknight event yeah i that's like cool. it i like it no i'm kind of uh, excited for this actually and we've got uh, the full card is now available to view on our website we have gordon ryan versus philip rowe the exhibition match we have Title matches between Beatrice Mosquito versus Luisa Montero for the 135 pound Nogi, uh, the bantamweight title there. The 125 pound Nogi, uh, excuse me, who's number one title will be going with Fionn Davis making her who's number one debut against Natalie Hibero, a highly anticipated debut. I think people are very, very excited to see Fionn, who took gold over the weekend at, uh, at Nogi Worlds. People are very excited to see her in action on our event, and with good reason. She's a very exciting grappler, very, very aggressive with great submissions then we've got an intriguing middleweight match excuse me welterweight match 170 levi jones leary against oliver taza this is an intriguing one for me because Kataza is the the real nogi specialist and you know the the leg lock uh technician going up against levi jones leary who only had one match at the nogi wheel nogi worlds lost to eventual middleweight champion hugo marquez in his opening round match uh, got stalled out, basically. Yeah, Hugo's a tough draw for anybody, but especially someone like Levi. Um, Levi wants to play guard, and Hugo is tactically very sound, right? Hugo pulled first, putting Levi maybe a little bit out of his element, scored, and then uh, made made no mistakes. Let's, let's say made put no it, mistakes. Let's, that's let's, a very diplomatic that way generously. of saying that he didn't engage for the rest of the match. Yeah. That's, uh, that's basically a recurring theme that we see, unfortunately, in certain people's matches. But, you know, people like Levi, um, they require people to actually want to do jujitsu with them to be able to win. And, and Hugo Marquez did a very good job of, as you said, scoring early and then basically using the rest of the match to avoid engaging and, uh, and didn't get scored on back. But Mikey Musumichi will be going up against Richard Alakon. I have no doubts that Richard Alakon will be going hard and forward and definitely want to engage with Mikey Musumichi because the 135 pound, the bantamweight title is on the line in this one. That's a good one. Yeah, and, and Richard's got a very forward fighting style, likes to play on top. If, if Mikey wants to try some wrestling, Richard Alakon's more than capable there, but I don't know if we'll see that. Because of course, Mikey is coming off a dramatic loss. So Mikey yeah. is going to want to come out with a statement. He wants to say, nope, that was a fluke. I'm back. So I think uh, we're going to see a fired up Mikey and Richard also chomping at the bit. So it's, it's a good dynamic in that match. Yeah, 100%. The prelims are really fun as well. We've got Brianna Samari, who uh, was in action again at the IBJJF World Nogi. Uh, did you catch any of her matches? Yeah, she, she, she had a couple of nice submissions, uh, very, very precise armbar. She took gold in her weight class. Um, she, she looked fantastic, as, as always. Yeah, she competed in the brown belt ranks. She's going to be going up against the 10th Planet representative, Brie Robertson, who is a, uh, well, if you haven't seen her, she competes a lot on the fight to win stage, and she is a real submission hunter as well. Has excelled so far in the submission-only format, and uh, will have her opportunity to shine on the Who's Number One mats on October 20th. We also have, as we mentioned a little earlier, Damian Anderson, the new Wave Jiu-Jitsu member, a student of John Danaher training underneath uh, the supervision of John, but coming up from under, or coming up through the ranks underneath Gary Tonin, actually, here in New Jersey. Damian Anderson is going to be taking on Estevan Martinez. Man, I can't wait for that one. I think that's going to be so exciting. That's a serious challenge for Estevan, you know, but he, loves, he lives for it, so I'm looking forward to that match. The greater the challenge, the, uh, the more possible it is to, uh, to make a huge mark on the fans. And I'm absolutely sure that Estevan will leave a lasting impression on the viewers of Who's Number One, October 20th, Wednesday, our first midweek show. And don't miss that one. 
uh, big show coming and this is actually really exciting i gotta say i am very very excited for the return of the emerald city invitational so uh corey and i actually went to the last emerald city event uh in atlantic city they are moving locations this is going to take place in martinsville new jersey december 4th emerald city invitational will host a 185 pound ebi rules tournament and there is a cool ten thousand dollars on the line for the overall winner this is a sanctioned ebi event too right eddie official Bra ebi rules officially yeah. endorsed by eddie bravo absolutely and i love yeah. the, la the last uh, emerald city invitational event a lot of a lot of great matches yeah cash your mind back that was the 145 pound tournament that gianni grippo won and there was some phenomenal matches on that show including from Gianni himself, who scored some dynamic submissions. Damian Anderson mm -hmm, fought through the mm -hmm. final, had a great run. Esteban Martinez had a potential match of the year candidate and many other really, really good matches. But let's talk a little bit about this one because this is a uh, this is 185 pounds. And I feel that, well, I mentioned this in our commentary over the weekend, actually, at Nogi Worlds, that the 185 pound division for me is that perfect combination of strength, power, athleticism, and technique. And uh, man, those athletes are just poised to deliver a great show and uh, we actually are able to exclusively reveal the first four names for this 16-man bracket are you ready let's hear them. are you ready Corey go for it okay number one I'm gonna start off with Diego Ramalio the ZR team black belt a uh, uh, based in North Carolina now a uh, coach and teammate for the uh, the the showman himself Esteban Martinez we Diego saw him take home Bruno Martinez's leg at uh, the Nogi Worlds just man just Diego's yesterday. been doing great in the Nogi yep. game actually you know he's really him Gabriel Souza and Esteban Martinez are three really uh, exciting intriguing competitors to watch and I think Diego Romalio has uh, he showed his aggression at the Nogi World Championships indeed he did never seen him under the uh, uh, Eddie Bravo rules uh, EBI rules in that so I think this is something new but uh, definitely a very capable very experienced black belt want to keep an eye out for him we also have Andre Petrosky, a, uh, a veteran of the most recent, se uh, most recent season of the Ultimate Fighter Chase. The one with Craig Jones as a coach? The one with Craig okay, Jones. Okay, yeah, cool. I didn't get to watch all that. Volkanovski but... versus Ortega. Mm. He was one of the middleweight MMA fighters uh, uh, on the show. And so uh, MMA fighters, man so tough you know you always kind of like look at them and sometimes it's easy to say oh yeah the grappling's not quite at the level of the the high level jujitsu competitions and yet good luck trying to tap them out yeah yeah and of course usually cardio is just endless for for most of those athletes so they abi uh, can be uh, a bit of a favorite uh, a favorite rule set let's say for them because you can't tap them and they have a gas tank so let's go to overtime see what happens yeah absolutely uh also we have Dante Leon took silver medal yesterday at the Nogi Worlds, and uh, he is ranked number three in the world at 170 pounds. Dante Leon is a, uh, well, just a powerhouse, as we know. He's going to be mm -hmm. going up in weight to take on this uh, this 185 bracket in the search for that nice $10,000 cash prize. Dante, trying to think. Corey, can you ever think of having seen Dante under EBI rules? I'm not sure that I have. Not offhand. He, I think he did one of the Fanatics events that had EBI. Really? Okay. Am I crazy? Am I am I wrong about that? Maybe not. I, I feel don't like know. I remember that, but maybe I'm making that up. <laughs> very possible. But yeah, Dante Leon, a very powerful grappler, very technical, and uh, we saw him score a nice rear naked choke or two actually over the weekend, right? So, man, better hope you don't have that guy on your back. That's uh, that that'd be a miserable place to be. And then the final uh, grappler that we were able to announce for the EBI Rules Tournament at Emerald City is John. Thor Blank, the 10th planet black belt out of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, 185 pound, one of the top ranked 185 pound grapplers in the world, a Nogi specialist. Oh, man, this uh, this guy, very well versed in the rule set, right, Corey? Yeah, absolutely. He is one of the uh, one of the EBI format veterans. Uh, he's uh, tied in with the, the finishers guys out in uh, out in Pennsylvania. So uh, a, a, a usual general referee and and very uh, very frequent practitioner in the EBI format. He know, knows how to win those matches, and obviously ADCC veteran as well. Um, he's looking great this year. Yeah, the, yeah. 
this sets a stage here for the 16-man bracket. If these are the first four names that they've, uh, they're have willing to announce, I think this is this is going to be incredible. I, I, I really think it's shaping up to be something special. It goes down on December 4th in, uh, as I said, Martinsville, New Jersey, and you'll be able to watch it live here on Flow Grappling. So uh, just one more event that I wanted to mention before we get out of here, and that's ADCC Trials. It's coming up. To, man, that's less than a month away. November 6th and 7th, two-day event. So the big news is that ADCC Trials, due to the sheer number of people who have uh, registered to compete, it's going to be huge. It's actually way bigger than was projected. So a little bit of context. The largest ADCC Trials in terms of the number of people who registered to compete until this point in time was back in 2019. The West Coast Trials had 300, approximately 350 competitors at that event. <laughs> ADCC Trials, East Coast Trials, coming up next month in New Jersey, has 800 competitors registered. Oh my God. That is going to be an absolute marathon. There have to be divisions with 200 people in them. There are. Oh yes, God. actually, there are. So we have we're not allowed to announce it just yet it's coming soon we're going to be able to publish the competitors list uh hopefully not too long uh, not too far away but i can tell you right now that certain divisions aka the <laughs> the 66 the 77 and the 88 it's going to probably be seven matches possibly even eight oh my to win God. gold it's a good thing they're spreading it out over two days. I hope, yeah, I hope you start at six a.m. Well, uh, we're going to have the, uh, <laughs> the most of the elimination also matches. Also, because I'm not going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have most of the elimination matches play, taking place on day one. The finals and uh, possibly quarterfinals, semifinals, and finals. We'll have to wait and see how it shakes out. Are going to be taking place on the second day, and uh, we'll be there. We'll be streaming every uh, every match over the weekend from every mat and uh you'll be able to tune in for commentary as well i'll be there and uh, we'll begin some uh, some very esteemed technician technicians some technique gurus on the call as well to break down some of the action gurus, but nice. uh yeah the um it's gonna be it's gonna be absolutely wild and yes we have seen some very very big names signed up to compete because as mo the organizers for the the uh, the world championships next year in 2022 has been very clear about this invites going to be very hard to come by the only way to guarantee your participation at the adcc world championships in 2022 is to go out and win a trials event so i think that the message has been received loud and clear and there are a ton of people vying for that spot mm. i'm excited i mean whoever comes out on top of that is going to be an absolute savage so it's gonna be a great event. It will. Are you excited? We're gonna go out to that one, Corey. Are you excited for that one? Oh, Atlantic I, City. I can't wait for for that. That both days are gonna be. I mean, looking at who uh, who may be in the roster. Uh, it, there's there's no way to. I mean, all all the potential super fights we could see in ADCC yeah. rule set. I mean, it's the, the big names don't stop. No, they really don't, man. I'm I'm so excited for this. They actually had to move venues because of the uh, the number of people signed up. Um, you know, Tom DeBlast, the uh, the local organizer, has managed to source a really cool venue in Atlantic City. It's the Showboat Casino, right there on the boardwalk, the famous Atlantic City boardwalk. It's uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Very excited for that event. Can't wait. And don't forget as well that. Tom has actually done something really cool at ADCC Trials. You know, not only do you have the five men's divisions, 66, 77, 88, under 99, and over 99 weight divisions, those weight, the winners of those divisions will qualify. However, he is also running uh, the two official women's weight classes as well, under 60 kilos and over 60 kilos. Now, the winners of those divisions will not uh, qualify for the world championships, but Tom, out of his own pocket, will pay for their travel to compete in the west coast trials which will have um the divisions that quali the winners of those will qualify for the worlds in 2022 so that's pretty cool you gotta love it plus let's not forget if there are any kind of dropouts and things like that you better believe the trials winners from the east coast are on the short list for stand-ins so. yeah great point great point indeed so i think that's about it from uh this week's episode of the grappling bulletin a uh, big weekend of jujitsu I'm going to go probably call up in a corner and die now because yeah, I'm really tired. Time, yeah, sure. after a long, long weekend. But some great jujitsu, some lots of matches to go back, catch the highlights, interviews, replays, and much more on Flow Grappling. We'll see you next week.